Please read this disclaimer. This videos all the character and all of its contents, including any disease and opinions expressed by the narrator, are strictly for entertainment purposes only. And it is not intended in any way as a substitute for professional service and consultation from licensed therapist, doctor, attorney, or other licensed professional service provider. Each person must make their own life decision, and those decisions are theirs. Hey listeners, welcome back to another out of the world new story with revolving time. Today's tale is about, Wife's has been hiding an affair that she doesn't think I know about. She was even playing word games and hiding the truth. In fact, I had planned to have her served with divorce papers tonight. Well my friends, go to the story and see what happened in there. My sister-in-law cheated, and I got ducked. Hi, Mike. It's Chris Harrington, Jenny Palmer's brother-in-law. Is Colleen available? I didn't hear the click, as Mike disconnected the call, because of my wife Mary's yelling and non-stop pounding on my locked home office door. I waited two minutes and redialed Mike and Colleen's home phone. Listen, Bast. If you call this number again, I'll report you to the cops. Do you understand? I do, Mike. I understand completely. But you need to understand two things. I don't care if you call the cops, and even more importantly, I'm going to talk with your wife and there's not much you can do to stop me. Have a good night. Despite the continued banging on the door, I leaned back in my office chair, closed my eyes and tried to make the last important decision of a long roller coaster day. Should I call my sister-in-law's husband? I asked myself. Update. I met my wife Mary in high school. I was a junior and was sitting in the bleachers with my buddies waiting for the start of a Friday night football game. A similarly sized group of girls from the sophomore class sat in front of us. As the game progressed, we took turns going to the concession stand. When it was my turn to go, I found that a cute blonde named Mary came with me. We carried hot dogs, french fries and sodas back, and Mary and I ended up sitting together. She was pretty, smart, had a good sense of humor and best of all, she didn't have a boyfriend. During the middle of the third quarter someone shouted out, Are we going to McDonald's after the game? There was near unanimous agreement that the girls and guys in our group would continue to have fun at the nearby McDonald's franchise. Deciding to take a chance I turned to Mary and asked, I'd rather have a pizza than greasy fries. Would you like to go to Tony's Pizza? I was thrilled when she agreed. Mary and I dated once a weekend for a couple of weeks and seemed to enjoy each other's company. We committed to go steady after two months of dating, and things only got better. Mary was my date to the junior prom and I was walking on clouds as I escorted the most beautiful girl in our school to the dance. I was in heaven, until I wasn't. Two weeks later, on the Monday leading up to the senior prom, I was jogging to the tennis courts for team practice. I was jogging with my neighbor Julie Burke. Julie was on the girls' team. I was a bit confused when Julie said, I think you're a really nice guy. Julie, we've known each other our entire lives, I responded. Why are you telling me now? She punched my shoulder as we ran and told me, it's great that you're letting Mary go to the senior prom with Jimmy Bay. Otherwise, he's so shy and nerdy he'd never got the chance to go. Jimmy Bay was a nice guy, but definitely was shy, nerdy and I suspect, on the spectrum. He was a neighbor of Mary's, and she always watched out for him. I wasn't surprised that Mary agreed to go to the prom, but was upset that she didn't have the decency to tell me. By Friday afternoon, six other people had complimented me on my maturity. They thought it was great that my steady girlfriend could be escorted to the prom by her friend and neighbor. Truthfully, I didn't feel mature. I was stunned that Mary didn't have the balls to tell me about the senior prom. I knew she'd come clean on our normal Friday night date. She didn't have a choice. At the last minute on Friday afternoon, I texted her and cancelled. I was barraged with texts and voicemails imploring me to call her. After a dozen dings on my phone, I finally sent Mary a text. I've known about your prom date since Monday. At least 10 people told me. It's too bad you weren't one of them. I want a girlfriend I can trust. That's not you. I turned off my phone and sulked. Mary and I didn't get back together until the start of the next school year. It was a Friday afternoon and I was heading to my car in the student parking lot. Mary was sitting on the hood of my car as I approached. Will you let an old girlfriend buy you an ice cream at Dairy Queen? She wanted to know. That was the start. We were exclusive for the next two years. During the second year, we had a long-distance relationship as I went to college in New York City. I was able to come home often and was thrilled to exchange virginities on a March Saturday night shortly after her 18th birthday. Mary and I dated until she left for college the following year. Two weeks into her freshman year, I received a Dear John email. It seemed that she was having too much fun in college and didn't want to be strapped to a full-time boyfriend. I never called or wrote. I was popular, got very good grades and was a Division III tennis player. I replaced Mary with a steady stream of girls starting the next night. 
I didn't see Mary again until two years after she graduated from college. I was working as a staff engineer for a local defense contractor and was out with some work associates after a long week. I literally bumped into her at the bar. We talked for a few minutes before we each returned to our friends. I'll admit that I kept an eye on her for the next hour and couldn't decide if I should follow her to the parking lot when her group started to break up. I chuckled when Mary's friends left. She walked to the bar, sat on a stool and ordered a drink. When she was served, she swiveled her chair until it faced me and stared at our table. I watched her with a dumb smirk as a stream of guys approached her, only to be quickly rebuffed. It wasn't until she looked me directly in the eye and held up two fingers that I excused myself from my friends. I needed to wait for Mary to tell another guy to get lost before I was standing next to her. Two, I asked. Mary smiled and said, yep. If you had let two more guys ask me out, I was going to accept his invitation. Mary and I dated for almost six months before we became exclusive and moved in together. We were married ten months later and lived a happy and totally fulfilled life for almost five years. My day started early. I had a 7.30 a.m. meeting with a longtime customer and friend. We were meeting at the downtown Marriott in New Haven, CT, home of a spectacularly overrated university that starts with Y. Tony was already sitting in the conference room I'd reserved. We chatted for a few minutes while I set up my laptop, laid out all the needed paperwork and filled a mug of steaming hot black coffee. Tony is a civilian contractor assigned by his company to work on the United States Navy's next-generation submarine propulsion system. I'm a senior mechanical engineer. My company is a defense contractor that specializes in marine mechanics. We had successfully worked together on three small but important contracts over the last few years. For some reason, we were each getting pushback from our immediate superiors on our current negotiations. We were told that we had one more chance to solve the seven critical issues remaining before others in our respective companies would take over the negotiations. Tony and I worked straight through lunch and finally took a deep breath at 2.15 p.m. Do you think your company will accept it, this time? I shrugged and told him, honestly, I can't understand why our last two proposals weren't accepted. Tony wondered, you and I have gotten close over the last few years. Do you think it might be a test, to see if we're too close? I chuckled and admitted, I've thought the same thing, and then tiredly stretched and shrugged again. How about a drink? Tony asked. I held up my notebook and said, I've got over 30 pages of notes that I've got to figure out. A drink won't make it any easier. I'm going to hang out and transcribe the important resolutions into my laptop. I'll email you a memo of understanding by 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Let's get on the phone immediately if there are any misunderstandings. I need to submit my report by noon tomorrow. That sounds good, Tony said as he started to pack up his computer. I walked Tony through the hotel lobby. And after he left, I stopped into the gift shop and bought a Diet Coke before returning to the conference room. As soon as I entered the room, I felt like the walls were closing in on me. Deciding to change the locale, I packed my bag and relocated to a quiet corner of the hotel lobby. I checked in with the office and found out that some small problems had developed over the course of the morning. After, I texted my wife and suggested that she have dinner without me. I settled into the comfortable lobby chair and got to work. The change in location helped, and I was able to plow through a great deal of work over the next couple of hours. I was so focused that I'm still surprised that her laugh caught my attention. I looked up and recognized Jenny, my sister-in-law, walking across the hotel lobby, wearing a traditional little black dress and sexy heels. She was headed straight to the check-in area. If that wasn't strange enough, her arm was wrapped through the arm of a tall, good-looking man. The man wasn't Jenny's husband, Scott. Without thinking, I turned on the camera app of my phone and took several pictures of the couple as they checked in. I took another set of pictures as they walked to the elevator, and a final set as they entered the elevator and kissed. As the elevator door closed, I quickly walked over and watched as the indicator light showed that they got off on the 8th floor. I was angry and confused. I loved Jenny, and I counted her husband as my best friend. I'll admit, I was in a daze as I sat back in my seat. Between the day-long intense negotiations and the shock of seeing Jenny with another man, my brain was fried. I didn't notice the man sit in the chair next to me until he reached out his open hand. He said, Hi, I'm James and I'm the general manager of the Marriott. As we shook hands I answered, Hi James, I'm Chris Harrington. I rented conference room L122 today. James nodded in understanding and then asked, I saw you taking pictures of the couple who just checked in. Do you know them? After a moment, I answered, I know the woman. Can I guess that you were surprised to see her with her gentleman friend? I was very surprised, I told James. Mr. Harrington, may I be blunt? After I nodded, he continued, 
I'm worried that there's going to be trouble if you stay here. I've never gotten into the kind of trouble you're talking about. I've never come close. There is likely to be a confrontation, but I'll walk away before we disturb your guests. James looked around the lobby. It was fairly quiet and no one seemed to be paying any attention to us. He handed me a folded sheet of paper. I unfolded it and found a man's name and address printed on the paper. James asked, Do you think there can be even less of a confrontation now that you have that information? I reached out my hand and as we shook, I said, I can almost guarantee it. I went back to work and was able to complete a surprising amount, given that I looked up at the elevator bank every few seconds. Update 1 When Jenny and her guy exited the elevator, it was nearly three hours later. My bag was packed and I was on my feet and walking toward them before they took two steps into the lobby. I was holding my cell phone to my face and snapping pictures as I approached the pair. Jenny was confused at first, but when I lowered the camera, her jaw dropped open and she visibly turned pale. I'd give you a kiss like I normally do, but I don't want to taste your boyfriend's dot on your lips. Chris, what are you doing here? I'm here for meetings. Why are you here? I could see Jenny willing herself to calm down. She took a moment and said, Chris, I'd like you to meet Mike Charmut. We work together. We're here to check out some meeting rooms for an upcoming event that our agency is hosting. I looked at Mike as he stretched out his hand toward me. It's nice to meet you Chris. I ignored his hand and asked, Mike is it? Can I ask you a question? Mike and Jenny exchanged strained looks before I could ask. Do you think Jenny is more attractive in this sexy outfit? I waved my hand, indicating how Jenny was currently dressed. Or was she wearing a hot black dress three hours ago when you visited the meeting room on the 8th floor? Before they could regain their thoughts, I looked down at Mike's left hand. Nice wedding band, Mike. I can see that you're as much a lying cheating pile as my sister-in-law. At that point, poor Mike lost his cool. In a hiss, he said, Listen, you don't have a clue what's going on. Just mind your own business. I'm sorry to tell you, Mike, but my slot sister-in-law cheating with a worthless as hall like you is my business. Mike jerked his head toward Jenny and angrily said, Can you handle this as hall? I need to go. Without waiting for an answer, he turned toward the hotel's front door and went storming off. I couldn't help it. As Mike walked toward the hotel's front door, I said, If I were you, I'd give your wife a heads up. I'll be calling. Mike stopped and slowly turned, directing his gaze at Jenny. He reiterated, Please take care of this, Jenny. After watching Mike exit the hotel, Jenny turned put her hand on my arm and said, Chris, can we go into the bar and have a drink? I'm sorry, Jenny. I've wasted a number of hours waiting for you to finish your duck party. Jenny cringed as I continued. I need to get home, have a drink and decide how to handle telling Scott and Mike's wife. Jenny squeezed my arm and pleaded, I only do this when Scott's away. It doesn't mean anything. I'm not hurting Scott. How long have you known me, Jenny? She didn't answer, but she was looking deep into my eyes. I'd guess it's at least a dozen years since I first dated Mary in high school. Does that sound about right? After letting the silence build, I angrily told Jenny, and in all that time, what would lead you to think I won't tell my best friend his wife is a lying cheating slot? As I turned toward the exit, I caught the gaze of James, the hotel's manager. He gave me a thankful nod as I pushed my way through the front revolving door. The rush hour traffic was gone as I started the half-hour drive north on I-91 toward home. The only annoyance during the drive was the constant rings on my cell phone. It seems like my wife was urgently trying to reach me. I pulled into our garage and closed the door behind me. After exiting the car, I heard my wife, Mary. She was standing in the open doorway that leads from our garage to the condo's kitchen. Where have you been? She wanted to know. I slid by her and walked into the kitchen. After dumping my work gear on the countertop, I noticed Mary's cell phone sitting on the kitchen table next to a half-full glass of wine. I picked up her phone, used the keypad to type in her password and opened her text messages. I could see the text message I sent many hours ago had been read, so I said, You know where I've been. You read the message. That's not what I meant, and you know it. As I headed to the den, to pour a couple of fingers of bourbon, I said over my shoulder, Then tell me what you mean. When I came back to the kitchen, Mary was sitting at the table. She asked, what did you do to upset Jenny? As far as I know, I haven't done anything to upset Jenny. Jenny, on the other hand, has upset me greatly. I watched Mary gather her thoughts as I sat across from her. Did you know Jenny is cheating on Scott? My direct question caught her off guard. She said it was only once. Well that's a lie, I told Mary. Jenny told me she only cheats when Scott is on the road. After a short pause, I continued, I noticed you didn't answer my question. Did you know that your sister cheats on Scott? Mary said, Chris, this is between Scott and Jenny. I smiled and told Mary, that's the first thing you've said that I agree with. It is between Scott and Jenny. 
My problem is Scott doesn't know there's a problem that desperately needs to be addressed. This is none of your business. Mary exploded. I want you to keep your mouth shut. I leaned forward and rested my elbows on the kitchen table. After folding the fingers of both hands together in prayer fashion, I said, You know me, Mary. You know me better than anyone. Mary expected more, and was startled when I got up and quickly walked to the kitchen archway. I hesitated for a moment before turning. I've asked you twice if you've known about Jenny cheating and you've refused to answer. I'll ask again, how long have you known? You know Jenny. She's always been a little wild. Zero for three was my immediate response. What does that mean? It simply means that you refuse to answer a question that I think is critically important to our marriage. What Jenny does when Scott's away doesn't have any bearing on our marriage. Mary said confidently. Well, let's see. I leaned against the arch and counted on my fingers. First, my relationship with your sister will never be the same, now that I know she's a lying slot. At every holiday that we celebrate with your family, I'll be reminded of your sister's treachery. Second, you've given me every indication that you've known about her vile behavior and I'm left wondering if you approve. That's not fair, Chris. Third, although I don't travel nearly as much as Scott, I'm on the road for one trip each month. For the first time in our relationship, I have to wonder if you've cheated on me. Mary's eyes got huge and she exploded. How dare you accuse me of cheating? I immediately jumped in and with as much intensity responded. I've never accused you of cheating. But your cavalier attitude to your sister's slot ting around has me wondering if you have. I stopped and glared at my wife before continuing. You and I both know you can't prove that you haven't cheated. All I have is my trust in you. And right now, that trust is severely shaken. I turned and walked down the hall to my home office. Update 2. After doing an internet search on Mike Charma, confirming he was married and having both calls to his home intercepted, I decided to tackle the last awful chore. I texted my brother-in-law, Scott, you're getting home on Friday. Am I right? It took 10 minutes before he responded, yep. I land at 2.30pm. Meet me at the pit stop. I'll be there at 4. Does this have anything to do with Jenny's frantic phone call wanting to know if we've talked? Scott wanted to know. I was trying to decide how to respond when my phone rang. I answered, Hi Scott, I wasn't going to hide my words from Mary, but I wasn't going to make it easy for her to hear this conversation through the closed and locked door. What's going on, Chris? It's about as bad as it gets Scott. Are you sure you want to do this over the phone? After a short pause, Scott asked, Is she cheating on me? I answered, Yes. The silence lasted several minutes and was only broken up by an occasional sob. I'll see you at the pit, he said. I was going to text Scott and let him know I was available to talk anytime he wanted, but finally decided to leave my friend alone. I was confident that he knew I had his back and was available to him anytime he needed me. Mary had quieted down while I was talking to Scott. I'm sure she was trying to listen. After hanging up, I heard her say through the closed door, Please come to the kitchen. We need to talk. After easing myself into a kitchen chair across from Mary, I took a nice gulp of Knob Creek and relished the slight burn in my throat. I glanced over at my wife and could see the wheels frantically spinning in her head as she prepared for her next attack. My brain was dead. I didn't have much fight left in me and knew that the last ounce of booze wouldn't help. I was waiting for Mary to start when my phone started buzzing in my pocket. I dug the phone out, looked at the screen and saw a number I didn't recognize. I answered the phone with an aggressive, hello. A female responded, I'm sorry to be calling so late. My name is Colleen Charmut. Someone from this number called my house twice earlier this evening. The calls upset my husband a great deal, and I suspect the caller was trying to reach me. With a sigh, I told her, Colleen, my name is Chris Harrington. I called earlier and I was trying to speak with you. In a somewhat somber tone, Colleen said, let me guess. You're calling to tell me that my husband is cheating with your wife. Close, I told her. He's cheating with my sister-in-law. Her name is Jennifer Palmer and I think they work together. There was a long pause before she responded. This is the third time I've received a similar call and it will be the last. How does a man do this to a wife and four children? I knew the question was rhetorical, so instead I offered. I have pictures of them checking in together at the downtown New Haven Marriott, kissing in the elevator as the door closes and returning to the lobby almost three hours later. Jenny was dressed differently after their date. The balance of the call was trading email addresses and a promise that I'd send the pictures in the morning. Mary looked shocked as she held her hands to her face. I continued, apparently this is the third time she caught him cheating. She is going to divorce him. Mary was stunned as she stared at me. I headed up to our bedroom. As I lay in bed and considered all that had happened to my extended family over the last few hours, I came to the conclusion that I wasn't to blame for all the sadness and destruction. As usual, my alarm went off at 5am. 
Instead of starting the day exercising in our basement gym, I quickly showered, dressed and headed to work. I wasn't trying to get away from Mary. I needed to get into the office and complete the memo of understanding and get it off to Tony. Thursday was busy. Tony and I needed to speak on the phone for 45 minutes to get the wording exactly correct on a couple of points, but I was easily able to get the completed agreement to my boss by the noon deadline. I spent the afternoon catching up with emails from the previous day and was heading home at 5 p.m., my normal quitting time. I had been wondering what the evening would bring and was only half surprised when I turned onto our street and saw Jenny's car and her parents' car parked in front of my home. It's going to be a long ducking night, I groaned. As I pressed the button to open the garage door, what did you say to Scott? Was the opening salvo from Jenny as I closed the door behind me. Glaring at my frightened wife, I said, I'm going to change. I'll be back in a few minutes, but I warn you, if I am disrespected by your family, in my house, I'll physically throw everyone out the front door. That includes you, Mary. I didn't wait for a reply and hustled down the hall to our bedroom. I decided to face Mary and her family. All eyes were on me when I re-entered the kitchen. Everyone was seated around the table. There was an empty seat between Mary and her father, Steve. Instead of sitting, I leaned against the kitchen counter, watched the group. I liked my in-laws. They were good solid people. Steve, my father-in-law, was a man I respected. He was straightforward, honest and you always knew what he thought of you. If you remained on his good side, you couldn't have a better friend in the world. If, on the other hand, you crossed him, I was confident he could make your life miserable. Steve considered Scott and me as friends. My mother-in-law thought of herself as a wheeler dealer and businesswoman extraordinaire. She owned and operated a well-known local real estate franchise with an outstanding reputation. While Betty oversaw the day-to-day operation of the business, everyone who mattered knew that Steve was the brains behind its success. Wouldn't you be more comfortable sitting here? Mary patted the chair next to her. I've been sitting all day. I'm good where I am. Jenny had her emotions a bit more under control. She asked, what did you tell Scott? I thought for a second. Before responding, I texted him and asked to meet when he got home tomorrow. I told him it was urgent. After gathering my thoughts, I continued. Scott called and wanted to know what was wrong. After I confirmed that he wanted to talk over the phone, I told him that you were cheating on him. He cried for a few minutes before he was able to confirm that he'd meet me. I was somewhat surprised at how devastated the family seemed to be. Mary was crying and said, I begged you to mind your own business. I wondered if her statement was for her family's benefit. I answered, and I told you, it was my business. My mother-in-law jumped in and said, that's debatable. Before I could comment, Jenny asked, are you going to meet Scott tomorrow? I am. What are you going to tell him? She wanted to know. I answered, I don't have much more to tell him. I've sent him the pictures I took and told him you were with Mike for just under three hours. I've sent him Mike's name and address, along with his wife's contact information. I'll guess that I'm going to be his support, and a shoulder to cry on. What about me, Chris? Jenny wanted to know. Don't I deserve support, too? I actually cracked a smile as I looked around the table. It looks to me like you have plenty of support, Jenny. I'll stick with Scott on this one. How do you know that Scott doesn't cheat on Jenny while he's traveling? It's common for married men to stray when they're away from home, commented Betty, the girl's mother. Although I can't imagine Scott cheating, if I'm honest, I'll have to admit I don't have a clue how he behaves when he's away. Until yesterday, I never gave a thought that Jenny was a cheater or if my wife might be cheating on me. The table exploded with how dare you and that's uncalled for. Mary was visibly shocked at my statement, so I jumped in and continued, at least I was upfront and told Mary that, last night. Her cavalier and dismissive attitude to Jenny's cheating has me concerned. Steve, the girl's dad, told me, Mary has never cheated on you. I can't believe you would think so poorly of her. I knew I had to be careful with my next few words. I didn't want to turn Steve against me. I purposely lowered the volume and harshness of my voice, looked Steve in the eye and challenged, prove it. After a few moments of silence, I continued, that's the thing, Steve. You can't prove that Mary hasn't cheated on me. I held up my hand when the protest started. All I have is six years of absolute trust in Mary. I told her last night that my trust in her is shaken. That's not fair, Chris. I jumped in. Before Mary could finish, I asked you three times last night if you knew Jenny cheated on Scott. You refused to answer my question. Instead, you changed the subject. You didn't lie, but you were dishonest. Yes, I looked at Mary as she admitted, I've known about Jenny's affairs. I haven't supported her, but I didn't want to cause a mess. Like this, she waved her hands, indicating our current problems. I've hoped that her affairs would run their course and Scott wouldn't find out. I was nodding. 
Although I was greatly disappointed that Mary hide her sister's infidelity, I could understand protecting her sister. Do you remember the talk we had about being exclusive a few weeks before you proposed to me? Mary asked. When I nodded, she looked directly into my eyes and said, I promise, I haven't had a romantic or intimate relationship since our talk. In fact, I haven't been with another man since we started dating after college. Call me naive, but I could see the angel I married five years earlier as she spoke those words. I love you and I believe you, I told my bride. Her family was kind enough to let a few moments pass before we continued our conversation. I could tell that Steve was particularly happy with the turn of events. Betty asked, what are you going to do about Scott? I'm simply going to support my best friend, just like each of you will support Jenny. Scott deserves my support, and I'm going to give it to him. Update 3. The following six weeks were a grind. Scott moved out of his house and into a nearby apartment. He immediately filed papers for an official separation from Jenny, but held off filing for divorce. I had dinner with Scott every Wednesday, while Mary kept the same schedule with her sister. It was a Tuesday afternoon and I was having lunch with a couple of work buddies at Clyde's Barbecue and Bar. We were sitting at a table for four when a man pulled out the empty chair and sat down across from me. Hey is Hall, I'll bet you forgot about me. It took a couple of beats before I was able to put a name to the face. Hi Mike. I heard Colleen has dumped your cheating ass. How does it feel to be an absentee dad? He said, duck you. It's your fault. I looked at my friends, Carl and Joe and saw that they were mildly amused. Turning my attention back to Mike, I answered, yeah, your divorce is my fault. Mike laughed and admitted, I guess it was partly my fault too. But there's so much married women around that it's impossible for me to stay faithful. Mike nudged Carl on his right. That's what I did with Jenny, his sister-in-law, when her husband left town. I turned her into my personal whore and I shared her and traded her with my friends. He winked and told me she was really popular and we used her for over a year. She loved every second with me and my friends. I was about ready to dump her when I ran into her and her younger sister at a happy hour. His smirk left little doubt about the rest of this conversation. Reaching into his back pocket, he pulled out an envelope and tossed it onto the table next to my plate. It was the type of envelope that held pictures. Mike's smirk told me everything I needed to know about the contents. I picked up the envelope and stuffed it into my sport coat pocket. Trying to provoke me, Mike asked, Aren't you going to show your friends? I'll bet that they'd love to see the pictures and video of your slot tie wife and her slot tie sister ducking my boys. I've been turning her out for over five months. What's the matter? Don't you have anything to say? I was gritting my teeth but needed to respond. I said, you've got to be the stupidest scumbag on the face of the earth. His smirk was still ear to ear when I told him, when I give Jenny's husband Scott those pictures, he's going to file for divorce. Since you are Jenny's direct supervisor, how long do you think it's going to take to sue you and your company? You'll be out of work in a week. It was hard, but I started laughing. The idiot knew he had underestimated me and he was considering his next move when I said, did you know I grew up in this town? What do I care about where you grew up? The as hall was in for a world of hurt, but I'd take my time. I know all the movers and shakers in town. I'd like to suggest that you leave town while your legs still work. I'm not scared of you. I've got witnesses that you threatened me. He indicated Carl and Joe. They both laughed and Joe said, he really is an idiot. You're getting divorced and losing your kids. You're going to be fired from your job while paying alimony and child support. Best of all, I'd advise you to be looking over your shoulder. Soon, someday soon, you're going to end up in a world of hurt. Mike stood and said, duck you, as Hall. My mind was whirling out of control as Mike walked away. Later, back in my office, I did look at the pictures and confirmed the most grotesque details imaginable for a happily married man. There were explicit photos of Mary with six different men. In a couple of pictures, the slot was surrounded by three men and a woman. A second grouping of pictures showed Jenny doing many of the same acts. The video was even worse and crushed my soul. After gathering my thoughts and pushing the overwhelming sadness and anger to the side, I called Scott and asked him to meet me for dinner. After 15 more minutes of staring off into space, I invited a second person to join Scott and me. I had tears in my eyes as I sat at my desk and continued to outline my plans. I knew it would be impossible for me to act normal around Mary. I had to get away. I traveled almost once a month for my company. Half of my trips were planned in advance. The other trips were urgent and last minute. I texted Mary, the Whitaker account is in trouble. I'm on my way to the airport. Scott and I had a very quiet dinner that night. After ordering beers, I handed him the small stack of pictures that Mike had given me earlier in the day. Scott was equally devastated for himself as he was for me. 
We agreed that divorce was the only option that worked for us and we discussed the possibility of suing the insurance agency that employed Jenny and Mike. In the end, we decided to follow the advice of our divorce attorney. We'd been sitting at our table for well over an hour when I saw Sal Morlu enter the bar. He scanned the room, spotted me and headed in our direction. He stopped to shake hands and exchange a few words with people at different tables. Sal is a generation older than Scott and I. His daughter Trish went through our school system, one year behind me. Sal owned a large automobile salvage yard just outside of town. Fifteen years earlier, when I was 16 years old, I was practicing my serve at the high school tennis courts one summer afternoon. Trish gave me a wave as she rode her bike past the courts. A few minutes later, as I was gathering up the balls, scattered around the court, I looked up and saw five classmates forcefully pushing Trish under the baseball field bleachers, about a hundred yards away. I had a pretty good idea what the as halls were thinking and I knew Trish wasn't that kind of girl. I ran from the courts and was under the bleachers a short few seconds later. Trish's t-shirt had been pulled off. She was screaming, crying and trying to cover herself. Stan Malloy turned just in time for the dot dot dot. I don't remember much after that. The three remaining as halls tackled me. Trish continued to cry as I tried to get my bearings. We left Trish's bike at the field and she helped me to my car. I was barely able to drive, but eventually pulled up to the front of her house. My car hadn't fully stopped before Trish jumped from the front seat and ran crying into her home. I had to get out of the car and circle it to close the door Trish left open. As I closed the door, I heard a crash and turned toward the house. A huge bull of a man was running toward me. His face looked ready to kick. It wasn't until he was close that he noticed the damage to my face and my hunched over posture. You're Harrington's kid. He growled at me. I was barely able to nod. I told him, I think I need an ambulance Mr. Morlow. I slumped against the car and slowly and painfully lowered myself to the ground. Mr. Morlow turned and yelled toward the house, call an ambulance. Do it now. Mr. Morlow kneeled next to me, took my chin in his hand and turned my head until we locked eyes. What the duck happened to my daughter? He wanted to know. Some as Halls pulled her under the baseball field bleachers. Was it you? He barked. I groaned as I shook my head. I was practicing at the tennis court next to the field. Each word was painful. There was fire in his eyes as he asked, what did those duckers do to mine? He wasn't able to finish the sentence. When I got there, they'd pulled her dot dot dot. I want their names. I told him the other three bast names as an ambulance and police car pulled up behind my car. Mr. Morlow said, if you ever need a favor, come and see Sal Morlow. When Sal got to our table, he sat without introductions being made. I handed him the envelope of pictures and waited a moment until he skimmed through them. When he looked up at me, I said, there's a man named Michael Charmut. He's a top guy at Jimmy Sullivan's insurance agency. His hobby is turning married women into slot s and sharing them with his friends. The pictures I showed you are of him and his gang with my wife and my brother-in-law's wife. Sal nodded his understanding. While I continued, I'm hoping that someday soon, he won't be as handsome. His walk will be much less athletic and he'll have trouble getting an erection. The three of us sat quietly for a number of minutes before Sal uttered his only words. As you'll both be single soon, it might be smart if you join a gym. You might decide to go from work directly to the gym every single night. You can work out together for a few hours and then go out and have a nice dinner afterward. He looked carefully at our confused faces before finishing. Do you idiots think you can have airtight alibis each night? When he finally knew that we understood what he was saying, he rolled his eyes, nodded to me, got up and slowly walked from the bar. Update 4. I didn't go home, as I had told Mary I was out of town. Instead, I checked into a nearby Marriott for the night. I was able to talk directly to my boss and I gave him an abbreviated version of my troubles. He agreed to let me work remotely and email my team and tell them I was traveling into the following week. The uncomfortable recliner in the corner of the hotel room called me. I slumped into the chair, closed my eyes and thought through the previous number of weeks. It was obvious to me that because of the hard line I took with her sister, Mary could not divulge her affair with Mike and his friends. She knew with absolute certainty that I'd divorce her. Mary was right. But as I thought through the divorce equation, I think. I hope I would have been fair if she had been honest and forthright. Instead, Mary continued to lie to me. I had to find out about her treachery in a public setting, surrounded by my friends and work associates. I can't imagine a scenario that would be more disrespectful and humiliating than sitting in front of your wife's pimp and discovering she is a whore. She had been unfair to me in the extreme and as a result, our divorce wouldn't be fair. Instead, I knew I had to destroy Mary. I vowed to myself that I would destroy my wife, my love and best friend in an equally extreme way. An amiable divorce was not in the cards for Mary. 
I struggled out of the recliner, walked to the office desk in the corner of the hotel room and made plans. It took until nearly 1.30 a.m. to sketch out my pre-divorce strategy for my line, cheating slot wife. The next morning, I was able to get an appointment with a divorce attorney for the following day. Despite the attorney's recommendation, I didn't begin to divide our finances. That would have to wait. I moved to an extended stay hotel and set up a remote office. I ignored phone calls and texts from Mary until Friday. At that point, I simply messaged her that I would be away for the weekend. Her response was beyond upset, and she called all weekend and begged me to call her back. Over the weekend I was able to purchase everything I needed for my plan. After my checklist was complete, I headed to the mountains for a long hike on Sunday. When I returned to the hotel, I turned on my phone and had texts and calls from Mary, each of her family members and a few work associates. Apparently Mary was extremely upset that I was off the grid and was trying to track me down. On Monday and Tuesday, I worked from my hotel room. I tried to tie up all loose ends, as I'd be out of the office the following day. Wednesday was the day. I checked out of the hotel after breakfast and headed home. On the way, I drove through the parking lot of Mary's employer to make sure her car was at work. I also put a GPS device under her seat. It took a couple of hours to set up the needed equipment and props at home and I was done by the early afternoon. At 2 p.m. I started a fire in our living room fireplace. Mary and I often enjoyed a nice fire on a weekend winter night. We'd sip wine, talk and snuggle as we watched the flames jump around the fireplace. But today wasn't a chilly February day. It was September and the outdoor temperature was 84 degrees in the early afternoon. I waited until 3 p.m. and texted Mary, just arrived home. My phone rang immediately. I let Mary's call go to voicemail, but she didn't leave a message. Instead, she texted me, fast. I watched the GPS indicator on my laptop. I had expected Mary to leave work immediately, but she didn't. She was going to show me. The fire was blazing and I continued to add logs to the top of the pile. At 5 p.m., when the GPS indicated that Mary had started her drive home, the temperature in the living room was stifling and easily over 100 degrees. Perfect, I thought. My heart hardened. I gritted my teeth and I waited for the bass to get home. Mary opened the garage door, and when she entered the kitchen, I heard her drop her briefcase by the door and felt her presence as she stood in the entryway to the living room. She walked in and found me sitting on the couch and watching the fire. There was a cheese and cracker plate and a bottle of wine on the table in front of the couch. I was holding one glass of wine. A second glass was at the other end of the table and was for Mary. What are you doing? The heat is overbearing, was Mary's comment. As I turned from the fire to look at Mary, I asked, what does it look like I'm doing? I've prepared a romantic welcome for my wife. I noticed that two beads of sweat were already running down her forehead and cheek. A romantic. The words caught in her throat and she didn't finish the sentence. Instead, she took a few steps closer to the fire, bent down and picked up a half-burned item off the stone. She held it up and studied it closely, before taking a step back and looking toward the top shelf of the bookcase. I thought she might hurt her back, she whirled so quickly to face me. Her eyes were wide in horror as she showed me the smoldering front cover of a book. It was the only part of the book that escaped the flames. It didn't look like Mary was in any shape to form words, so I calmly told her we didn't have any kindling to start the fire, and so I used a couple of those old books. I nodded to the empty space on the top shelf where Mary kept a full row of books. I only used four or five. We have plenty more to start our next fire. While talking, I had gotten up from the couch, grabbed Mary's glass of wine and was holding it out to her. I watched as her face morphed from incomprehension to rage. On the day that Mary was born, her dad gave her a present. The present was the most popular children's book of the previous year. On the first empty page, her dad wrote Mary a love letter that was heartwarming and described his hopes and dreams for his daughter. Her dad gave her the same birthday present each year. She had 28 books, each a reminder of her father's love. I clenched my jaw as I saw Mary scream and start to swing. I'm not sure if she intended to dot me. Her hand dot 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 me. Her face changed as she started to cry. I could again see utter confusion. Without saying a word, she turned and ran up the stairs to our second floor bedroom. I heard the door slam behind her. Update 5. Although I was devastated because I knew my marriage was over, I did smile. My plan had worked to perfection. I pulled my cell phone from my pocket and dialed the number. 911. What's your emergency? My name's Chris Harrington and I need police help with a domestic situation. After giving the dispatcher my address, she asked, Are you in a safe place Mr. Harrington? I am. My wife has locked herself in our bedroom. I'll be sitting on the front porch until the police arrive. Do you need medical attention? The dispatcher asked. No, I wasn't hurt that badly. 
Per police procedure, the dispatcher stayed on the line until the first police car arrived. I know my call was recorded and I was very careful how I answered her questions. Almost immediately after the first patrol car pulled to the curb, a second arrived. Three police officers crossed the grass together. Thanks for coming officers. What's going on? I turned my head so they could easily see the damage to my left side. My wife Mary dot me. Why did she? He wanted to know. I wanted to be careful with my answer. I told him, my wife has become verbally abusive over the last several months. I suspect that she is conflicted. She has been hiding an affair that she doesn't think I know about. In fact, I had planned to have her served with divorce papers tonight. When we talk to your wife are we going to find any damage? I've never touched my wife or any other woman in anger, was my honest answer. As the two younger officers entered my house to talk with Mary, I said to the third, Would you like to see a video of my wife? Me. You have proof of the assault. I haven't looked at it. I think I have proof. As I finished, I waved for him to follow me. My laptop was on the kitchen counter. I needed to wake the computer and find the cloud-based storage account. I opened the folder, backed the video up 30 minutes and found the start of our confrontation. I pressed play and stepped away so the police officer could clearly see the action. He watched until Mary left the room and ran upstairs and then asked to watch it again. After the second time through, He keyed the communication device on his shoulder and said, Arrest Mrs. Harrington. Almost immediately, I heard Mary screaming from upstairs and my heart started pounding. I knew the officer had asked me a question, but I needed him to repeat himself. Are all the rooms in your home under video surveillance? This was a line of questioning that I didn't want to get into, but knew I had to answer honestly. No, the living room is the only room with a camera. He nodded his head in understanding while scratching his chin in thought. How long have you had the camera in the living room? I shrugged my shoulders and admitted, it's a fairly recent addition. Our staring contest was broken when Mary screamed and begged, Chris, what's going on? Please, please help me. I was about to respond when one of the young officers shouted, Sir, this is a police investigation. Please leave immediately. He was talking to an older man standing in the open front door of my home. With just as much authority the man said, I am an official process server and I am here to serve Mrs. Mary Harrington. He marched up to Mary as all three officers took a step closer in case things got out of hand. The man asked, are you Mary Harrington? When Mary nodded, he held up an envelope and said, Mary Harrington, you are served. In addition to the divorce petition, there is a restraining order keeping you away from Mr. Christopher Harrington, his home and his work. Because Mary was handcuffed, he handed the envelope to the officer who was holding Mary's elbow. As the process server left, I turned to Mary. I watched as the panic and confusion drained from her face. It was replaced by calm. She looked at me and asked, how did you find out? Mike told me, as the two younger officers escorted Mary to the backseat of the patrol car, the third officer gave me his business card and asked that I email a copy of the video. I walked him to the front door and watched the first car pull away with Mary. The older officer had stopped halfway down my front walk. He turned and asked, I've seen you on occasion at the pit stop, haven't I? Yes, I recognize you to sergeant. He told me, four years ago, I divorced my wife for cheating. I'm paying alimony, child support, health insurance and the mortgage on the house that she lives in with my kids and her as hall boyfriend. Maybe the next time I see you at the pit stop, you'll let me buy you a beer and you can tell me what the duck happened here today. I went to work the next day and was able to be somewhat productive as I survived Thursday and Friday. I actually groaned out loud when I arrived home on Friday night and found my father-in-law sitting on my front step. After pulled into the garage, I got out of the car and yelled, Come in this way, Steve. As he entered, I was pouring two extra large knob creeks. We sat at the kitchen table, slowly sipping our drinks for many minutes before he said she was cheating too. I simply nodded. Is there any hope? He wanted to know. I calmed down enough to be kind and respectful to Steve. I answered, it wasn't just one time and it wasn't with just one man. I took another taste and then told Steve the complete truth, and it wasn't with just one man at a time. He looked at me with disbelief and before he could respond, I told him, I've seen pictures and videos that make me want to throw up. Steve shrunk in his seat and turned white. A tear ran over his cheek. We sat together for a long time. Each of us was caught up in our own thoughts and memories. Mary and Jenny didn't learn this behavior from their mother or me. His intense stare was just short of chilling. Everyone knows that. Several more minutes passed before Steve rose to his feet and circled the table. As I stood, he grabbed me in a tight bear hug and sighed into my shoulder. After letting go, he shuffled to the door with the same gait as a 90-year-old man. After opening the door, he looked over his shoulder and said, burning those books was a bad thing to do. 
I had completely forgotten about the stunt I used to start the altercation with Mary. I nearly shouted when I said, hold on. I exited the kitchen and was back within seconds with a small box. I handed it to Steve. After opening it, he looked at me with a stunned expression. I told him, I know you treasured those books and I never would have destroyed them. Then how? He was too shocked to finish his thought. I told him, I went out to the bookstore and got a copy. As is my normal morning habit, I sat at the kitchen table that sat morning and scanned our local newspaper on my tablet. I smiled when I read. Hartford Times, local section. West Hartford police are investigating the savage assault on a local man as he left a neighborhood bar in the Elmwood section of the city. Michael Charma was attacked in the rear parking lot of Tops at approximately 10.30. His injuries are extensive and require hospitalization. A spokesman for the WHPD said that the police have several leads and expect a quick arrest. It was a bright and sunny November morning. I watched the red Ford SUV park a few spots from me and the driver slowly pull himself out of the vehicle. Hi Mike. I was in the parking lot in front of Jackson Physical Therapy and was sitting on the open tailgate of my Ford pickup. A little bird had told me that Mike had a 10.30 appointment. I continued, it might be a good idea if you get a handicap tag so you can park in a space closer to the building. Cat got your tongue, as Hall. I asked with a smirk. I have to give Mike credit. He hobbled toward me using a cane and stopped 10 feet away. He knew that Scott and I had been questioned by the police and later cleared, but I suspect, in his gut he knew we were involved. The hate in his eyes was palatable. I was confident that Mike and I would meet sometime in the future. I didn't want to be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life, so I arranged this meeting. Mike slowly turned and took his first shuffle when I said, Mary Marie Charmont from Milford, Connecticut. As he turned back, I continued, Susan Burke from White Plains, New York and Lori Fitzpatrick from Brockton, Massachusetts. The hate in his eyes turned to confusion. I continued, if anything happens to me. I've made arrangements for my friends to visit your mother and sisters. I was surprised. Mike stared me down for several long moments before giving me a quick nod. I wasn't sure whether he was nodding his understanding or calling a truce. He turned and stumbled along toward the entrance of the building. I'm glad to report it was my last contact with Mike Charmut. Final update. I did give my divorce lawyer the power of attorney needed to handle all legal issues related to our split. We didn't have kids. We earned roughly the same amount of money. And most important, I didn't care about anything other than separating myself from Mary. I received a call from my lawyer a few weeks after I had Mary served. She told me, we've reached an agreement almost exactly along the terms we discuss. However, Mary won't sign off until she's had the opportunity to talk with you. I mumbled a profanity and was advised, just do it. Sit down and let her talk. Get it over with. Here's what I'll agree to. Have Mary sign the papers and you approve everything, so it's official. I'll meet with her for one hour in a conference room at your office after she's signed the papers. I heard, that should work, before the call ended. Three days later, I was sitting in the conference room. June, the paralegal, knocked on the door, opened it and told me, everything has been signed off and notarized. She nodded and backed away from the door leaving Mary standing in the entrance. She had obviously put some effort into her dress and makeup, but that didn't matter. She circled the table, bent down and kissed my cheek, before taking a seat across from me. Are you as nervous as I am? She wanted to know. My initial thought was, what a weird way to start, but I gave her question some consideration. I shrugged and admitted, I'm not nervous. I'm more anxious. I want to get this over with and be able to get on with my life. Tears started running over her cheek when she told me I was blackmailed. Mike was going to put videos of Jenny on the internet. Her dad had called me early in the divorce proceedings and told me the same thing, so I wasn't surprised. It might have started with blackmail, but I watched the videos. You may have felt coerced, but that isn't any reason to duck up our marriage. Just because you found out Jenny was a slot does not mean you needed to turn yourself into a slot. Mary exploded. I was so confused and didn't see any alternative. What could I have done? You could have. And you should have. Trusted me. I was angry when Mary rolled her eyes. I continued. Together with Jenny, we would have gone to the police and filed a report. We'll never know if the police could have developed the evidence to do anything. We do know that his wife and employer would have found out and we would have had a tiny bit of satisfaction. Even more important, we'd still be together. Unfortunately, you didn't trust me. Truthfully, I don't know if you ever did. What are you talking about? Mary wanted to know. I answered with a question. Do you remember why we broke up the first time? The first time? Do you mean in high school? Mary looked utterly confused. What does that have to do with anything? In high school, you didn't trust me enough to tell me you wanted to help your neighbor Jimmy and go to his prom with him. You've got to be kidding me. 
I was a dumb high school kid and I was worried about hurting the feelings of my first serious boyfriend. Were you a dumb college kid too? I asked. When she gave me a questioning look, I continued. On Labor Day weekend, before you started college, we made love in a raft on Simpson Lake and after we promised that we would remain faithful and get married after college. Your promise lasted 10 days. Mary angrily asked, Are you telling me that you were completely faithful the first year you were in college? I shook my head and ignored her pointless question. My point is, whether you agree or not, I question if you ever trusted me. I don't think either of us would argue that I have every reason to not trust a word that comes out of your mouth at this point. You straight out lie. When you're not lying, you are playing word games and hiding the truth, trying to change the direction of the conversation. Mary told me, I haven't seen Mike since all the trouble started. When I smirked, Mary asked, what? Mike had an unfortunate accident. He's not able to perform at his previous peak level. What are you talking about? And how could you possibly know? I know, because that's what I dot to have happened. Her hands covered her face as she stared wide-eyed across the table at me. He's not a good man, Chris. I'm scared for you. I met Mike a few weeks after his accident, and we had a very civilized chat. I'm almost positive that I convinced him our association needs to end. Mary's expression changed from frightened to love. I'd seen that look countless times over the years. You still love me, she nearly shouted. I was so surprised at her outburst that I laughed. Mary was obviously frustrated and said, You can't tell me that you don't love me. I shrugged and told her, You're right. I can't say that I don't love you. I also can't say that I do love you. What you need to understand is I am unwilling to put the time and effort into growing any love that's left in me. Mary nearly exploded. Why would you ever say that? It's simple. I looked directly into her eyes and told her, You aren't worth it. Mary sat back and noticeably shrunk into her chair. Tears continued to stream down her cheek and I could see that she was breathing through her open mouth. I reached into the folder that had been sitting on the table in front of me and took out three pictures. One by one, I placed the pictures in front of her. The bottom line for me is my future children and I deserve someone better than that vile woman as our mother and wife. Goodbye Mary. Thank you for being a part of our journey and we look forward to sharing more powerful stories with you in the future. We encourage you to subscribe to our channel and stay connected with our community. Remember, this channel exists because of your support, and I want it to be a place where we can all come together, learn, and have a great time. Your feedback is vital, and I appreciate every single suggestion and comment you provide. Take care yourself and see you soon.